Uh, Douglas is was a an impassioned CTO who started a new job this week and as the first order of business in that new position was taking a few days off to come to Sydney. So um, I won't hold you up any longer so that we can get out to lunch on a reasonable schedule. Please welcome Douglas. Alright, um, so I'll jump right in it because I know that uh, holding you guys up from lunch. Um, just quickly a little bit about me. Uh, as uh, Michael mentioned, I was uh, CTO Glow for almost five years. And this is pretty much, this, is, uh, this presentation is really about what I learnt at uh, Glow and what we did there and some of the findings uh, which I really wanted to share with everybody. Um, but recently I've switched, um, become a team lead at Pepperstone, which is a financial services uh, online broker. And yeah, I'm really appreciative of those guys letting me come up here in my first week. Um, I've always loved open source uh, right from the early days, making a contribution to, I think there was some plug-in in, in uh, uh, Visual, oh, I can't remember even the ID it was, but it was the one Java ID from a long time ago, um, and getting that put into that. Um, currently I'm maintainer for MongoDB migrations, um, it's a sort of, uh, it's the same as the doctrine migrations, um, but for MongoDB. Uh, fun fact, my first three years of my life I had penguins living under my house, these little guys. Um, I guess that's why I sort of fell in love with Tux earlier on. Uh, had something going on there right from the start, but um, even though it sounds kind of romantic, they actually make a hell of a noise and uh, keep you up all night. But um, yeah, there's no houses there anymore on Phillip Island, but uh, uh, when I was young we had a house out there. All right, my aim with this chat, um, basically, uh, I just want to sort of elicit a bit of a sort of conversation. As uh, Michael mentioned, uh, you know, the guys at Figured talked about microservices, so I want to add another view to that. Um, and really, I just want to sort of elicit some curiosity from everybody. If that's all I get, then I'm, I'm happy if, uh, if you sort of go away thinking, yeah, maybe we'll have a look into this. Um, Oh yeah, microservice architecture for the win, probably a little bit over the top, but you know, maybe if you get that far, then that's great yeah, as well. Um, the plan, I just want to describe the motivation first, why you might want to do this, um, dispel a couple of myths, um, and then uh, introduce a microservices architecture hack, which actually gets rid of some of the problems you might have with using microservices. And then I'll talk a bit about the concepts and the structure. And, uh, you know, uh, what I'm going to talk about is very high level and I will be just flying through it, but really it's just to get the sort of the basics out there. Um, you'll have to do a bit more digging to get into it, but um, it'll be a bit of a whirlwind tour, but uh, I hope it gives you some ideas. Uh, then I just want to cap off what do we get for all that, why would we bother? Um, can you do it with an existing project? How can we move incrementally? Um, and Lastly, just is it all smooth sailing? No, of course, and I think you know, any honest presenter of any topic really should talk about the gotchas. Um, so let's get going. So motivation in considering designing your system as a set of microservices. Uh, well, the first thing I'd say, and the main thing, is growth. So, uh, you know, the future is uncertain for whatever projects you're working on, um, but we want to be optimists and we want to plan for growth. So you might have just built something small uh, and you know some projects are just going to be retained that small shape and you know ahead of time and that's fine. But other projects, you know that the business wants to grow. They want to, they want to do more and there'll be more things coming in the future. So if you plan for growth, uh, then that's, a, that's basically the major motivation for going down the microservices architecture. The kind of things that can grow is uh, business requirements, uh, product features, customer demand, uh, developer headcount, you're just getting a bigger and bigger team. Um, dependencies, uh, libraries, you know, after a period of time you find you're pulling in a lot more stuff, a lot more third party APIs, uh, lines of code, just generally all these things will grow in time. And if you think that's likely, you're optimistic about the business or the project that you're running, that things will grow, then that's really the motivation to have a look at this stuff. So how do we tame complexity early? How do we sort of get a lid on it right from the get-go? 
Now, so when we started, I had a look into this, and I really like some of the things I was saying up here. Um, you know, this collection of loosely coupled surfaces, uh, improves modularity, easy to understand, develop and test, paralyzes development, enabling small autonomous teams to develop. And all those things, well, so that sounds good. So give it a whirl. Um, now, you might have good, clear directory structure and namespaces, and that's really good and that's really fine. Um, but I guess the challenge is, what if those namespaces were separately deployed on separate boxes? What would that make you start to think about differently? Um, so I think there's a motivation here is the conversation that you can have just by thinking about this. Uh, things like proper dependency management. I mean, you can think about it in the monolith, but it's a lot more difficult because all the classes are there, they're all available, they're all auto-loaded. Um, you don't really have to think about how different parts of the system are going to uh, depend on each other. There can be cyclic dependencies and all those sort of things because it's all in one thing. So you don't really have that conversation, you don't really think about that so much. Um, interfaces and contracts, yeah, you can definitely do that in the monolith, of course you do, but I think with microservices you're really forced more to think about that. Um, uh, isolated behaviour, again, single uh, responsibility principle. These things are kind of a bit more enforced upon you because uh, you are having to deploy things separately. High internal cohesion, low external coupling. It's one of those object-oriented basic sort of principles. Um, this is sort of going up into the macro level or slightly higher <laughs> above the domain object model. Um, you're wanting to do it there. Um, now, dispelling some myths. So, only big projects, that's one idea, and it's going to be too complex to do. So, firstly, only big projects. Well, in our case, we pretty much got started at the start. We did a bit of a monolith at the start, but pretty much, pretty much at the start we, we, we did it. So it wasn't a big project then, obviously. Uh, we were really small. Um, I think at the, probably the most PHP developers we might have had was about four. Uh, so we're definitely not a big project in any stretch of the means. I think that kind of dispels the first myth. Um, too complex. Now, there's really good reasons for this, and uh, I understand why. You know, you think about multitude of production services, you might think about API versioning, um, things like complicated builds and deployments, uh, difficult development environments, you know, how's it going to run? Is it Docker Compose and all this stuff comes up, and how do I get it working? And this sounds uh, like a lot of work resource contention, there's all sorts of things that people think about when they go to microservices, uh, which is difficult. Um, races, back pressure, all these sort of things that people have to consider. Um, debugging and tracing becomes a lot more difficult too when you have a whole lot of services running. <coughs> However, we have a complexity hack on all that. Um, this is what we've done. Uh, this is what we did at Glow. Um, basically, we designed microservices architecture but we deployed it as a monolith. Um, so you're kind of going to go, ooh, why would you do that? Now, well, we wanted to get the benefits of a microservices architecture and all those things that we talked about before, uh, you know, having uh, the low coupling, understanding dependencies, understanding how the different parts of the system would talk to each other. Um, we wanted to have sort of a launch pad for the future into a proper microservices architecture um, all dependent on all those things we talked about in growth earlier. Um, but we want to keep it all as one unit at the start because we didn't want to go down all those things early too prematurely. You didn't want to have to do all the API versioning and all those sort of things. All right, so I'm going to jump into how did we do it. And again, this is uh, pretty high level, but um, what I'm going to talk about here is just a couple of key concepts that are pretty important. Um, and then I'm just going to quickly go through describing a request passing through a bus-driven architecture. Uh, and then I'm going to explore how the code could be packaged. All right, so some, some key concepts. There's really two main ones. Um, the first one is domain-driven design. Uh, this is all, uh, I think the important things that we sort of learnt from this was um, having language consistency. So you have within a boundary of a, of a domain, all the language is always the same. And it's just a really simple example I use, and it, it'll come up again, I think, in the Prezo, is, you know, a marketing person might call them a consumer, um, but uh, somebody in operations might call them a trader. 
it's the language in those two business units. They're talking about the same person, but they use different terms. Um, Domain-driven design says that within a domain, it should be ubiquitous language. Now, in terms of these books, um, uh, the blue book is kind of the one people say, you know, that's the, that's the granddaddy, that's the thing that kicked it all off. Um, but going in order of sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, a bit more esoteric, a um, bit difficult to get into this book, a big book and a bit of a challenge to sort of a bit more closer to our world and day-to-day -day development to code in PHP so you can get right you know, into that. And you know, for some of us that just love reading everything, yeah, sure, go, go through all that stuff. Uh, for some of us that are pretty time poor, it's kind of like, you know, skim a couple of chapters here, skim a couple of here, is that relevant? And, and then maybe dig through this in a bit more detail. Um, and I don't think you'll lose anything uh, by not, you know, reading the, this thing cover to cover. Um, command query responsibility, uh, requ oh, sorry, re request segregation. Basically, the idea here is um, uh, you have a class that you make changes to, so that's the right model. So you have a business object that is uh, sort of doing all the uh, domain logic. Um, it's deciding whether you can update a password. It's doing all those sort of things. That's the right model. But separately, you have another class, which is actually the read model. Um, so if somebody uh, says, I want a list of users, that's a totally different model from the one that saves a user. Uh, that's the idea behind it, because there are different characteristics between writing and reading, um, especially in the, in the bigger apps. And you'll have different requirements in writing and reading. And so the idea is that the write models are pretty, sorry, the read models are pretty light. The write models do more of the, the work. Um, another thing just to touch on too while I'm here is that with domain driven design and CQRS, it's not a sort of got to dive in and do everything. Um, uh, we basically, we sort of, we cherry picked the bits that we liked. We wouldn't have a write and a read model for all our stuff. We often used write models as read models. But then as things changed, we already had it set up in such a way that we could write a read model which is more targeted at the requirements of the product at the time. Um, so you don't sort of kill yourself with over-engineering it, but you can take bits and pieces. Uh, the same with domain-driven design. They've got kind of an aggregate route with lots of objects hanging off it and value objects and all these things, but we sort of, we kept that stuff pretty simple. All right, now I'm going to fly through this request journey. Uh, okay. Now, sorry, there's a bit on here, but it's, I think it's kind of important. And some of this stuff will be a little bit familiar uh, into the Laravel community uh, in terms of, you know, there's the, the commands and there's events and those sort of things. Um, but this, and this whole presentation is, is you know, uh, intentionally framework agnostic. Um, and this is sort of how it looked for us and how uh, a lot of the domain-driven design CQRS frameworks work. Um, you just got a request coming here to a controller. One of my motivations for getting on this thing is that I really wanted to get away from controllers that had too much logic in them. That's something that I felt was a smell. Uh, and looking at these frameworks, I realised that the only thing that controllers ever do is they post a command on a command bus. So it's almost impossible to make a controller fat um, because it doesn't really do any work apart from marshalling the request, creating a command and posting it onto the command bus. Um, you might have a little bit of authentication, obviously, stuff like that in there, um, but basically there is no, there's no business logic whatsoever. Um, and it means that the developers and the team, they don't ever, you know, create anything in here which is saving or checking stuff. It goes off onto the command bus. There's a command handler which is subscribed to the command bus. And the command handler uh, basically works with a repository. Uh, it just has an interface to a repository, but the concrete implementation, you get load and aggregate root, which is just, aggregate root is just the uh, domain-driven design word for a business object, business class model. Um, this is one of these things with this kind of stuff, you have to play the language game and get up on the terminology that they use and realise sometimes actually they just mean this, but it's a bit of a fancier word. Um, the aggregate root will do something like update password and then raise an event. Uh, that event will get stuck onto the event bus. Uh, and of course, you will be probably 
uh, familiar with uh, listeners, and it's the same thing here. Uh, it can get into another business domain, so the notification domain. Uh, that could be listening to the password updated event. The event listeners subscribe to that event. Again, it talks to some repository. There might be some aggregate routes. Might do some work with a third party API. Could be anything. All right. Now, just going to jump into, going to switch, this could be dangerous, going to switch presentations uh, packages and go to Prezi for a sec. So as long as this thing doesn't squeal at me. Dokey. I use this because it was, it's many layers of an onion sort of question, so I just thought Prezi was a good uh, way of getting into understanding how things get structured. Um, this is a little bit more sort of a uh, bit closer to the ideal way that you want to package it. Um, again, you know, you bite off as much as you can chew. Um, we didn't do it quite as purely as I've laid it out here, but you would if you, um, if you could. I'll talk a bit about that. So your monolith base app, it depends on all the things, you know, in your composer, it's got all the stuff. Contains the front controller, sort of kernel, standard app config, your infrastructure is code, you know, you might have your Docker files or uh, any of those sort of things, your GitLab or your Bitbucket pipeline jobs and all those sort of things. You may have some database migrations, but actually you don't have to have any code in the, in the source folder whatsoever. So, no domain classes, no controllers, nothing. Okay. Um, and then what we've got over here, to get my $3 pointer from the $2 shop. We've got a couple of domain packages here. So you can imagine this might be, might be user, uh, this one might be uh, ledger, and this one might be uh, notifications or Basically, you have all these packages, which are a bit like your namespaces that you would have now. Um, and we'll talk about this little shared package. And an aggregator package is just an example of how you can get creative and create your own, which do certain type of jobs. So jumping into the domain package, it's a group of repositories, so source control repositories, um, that handle business domain. The package represents a context boundary for the domain, so everything in this should have the same language. Um, it's consistent. Again, ubiquitous <laughs> language is one of those terminology that comes out of domain-driven design that people talk about. It just means that it's consistent. Um, and the package has its own database. In the core, so again, this is going into, there's a core repository. This is all in one package. So I've got an example here which say it's, it's a user. Might have a namespace, my company, user, domain, user, command handler, query handler, and listeners. Um, business domain objects are unit tests, very few dependencies. You might depend on some domain-driven design CQRS package, um, but you don't, you don't, you don't uh, depend on uh, uh, any other frameworks. Um, and it might depend on the domain API itself, um, and it may depend on another domain package's API if it has some dependency to what it needs to do there. Um, so the domain API, this is the contract package basically. It has basically no dependencies. I mean, apart from maybe you might use that, but even that I think would be um, optional. It can be really much plain uh, PHP classes. Uh, depend on this uh, in the other packages if you need to talk to this package. So if you need to talk to the user package, you would pull this one in. You get all its commands, you get all its queries, you get all the events that it emits. And as soon as you get all those, you can start listening to them. Now, the infrastructure package Again, infrastructure's terminology comes from domain-driven design. Um, the bundles, uh, this bundles the package into your app and the database frameworks of your choice and whatever else you might need. It's kind of the bit that glues it in. Um, so it supplies concrete implementations of the interfaces that live in core. So you might have the real repository code there, whether that might be um, eloquent uh, doctrine um, or just vanilla straight. Uh, access your PDO or whatever it is that you want to access directly. Provides all the dependency injection and container compilation responsibility. So basically when you do the composer, 
you know, require of this domain package, you'll pull this one in. Actually, you could probably just pull this one and it'll pull in the other two. And as it comes in, then you've got something which will actually bind it into the container of your framework. Um, so it depends on quite a few things. It depends on this uh, domain-driven design package, on the core, on the API of the same package, on the app framework you're using, um, database framework, and other third-party libs and things like that that you might be using. So you might be uh, the user, perhaps it needs MailChimp or it needs something else. Okay. Shared package. Uh, so this is kind of the shared kernel. They call it shared kernel. Um, domain classes and shared infrastructure components. Um, so shared core is shared business domain objects in unit tests, but be careful, only legitimate. It's crazy not to be dry in this case, classes. So you might have things like address and money identity. Now, why I'm saying that be careful is that you don't want this thing to become a great big thing that just, you know, oh, well, that one needs it and that one needs it. I'll just chuck it in here. Um, it's definitely not meant for that. In the idea of domain-driven design is if a package needs a user class, say the notification ones, then you create a user class in that notifications package. You don't chuck it in here and share it between the two of them. Um, because the user in the notifications package may only need email uh, and ID, whereas the user in the actual user package needs all the other stuff. Um, and the idea is you do repeat yourself. It's one of the important things. Okay. Shared infrastructure. Look, this is kind of something we did because there's just a lot of boilerplate cloud in those infrastructure packages. We're using the same framework and there'd be the same stuff. This would just remove some of that heavy lifting. And the aggregator package, well, this is an example of something like if you needed a whole lot of packages to work in concert, then this will orchestrate it. Um, it takes the, uh, the burden of dependencies away from other packages, so it can be a way of sort of alleviating the fact that lots of packages need lots of other ones by using an aggregator package. Um, depends on the API packages to get the job done. It can have a whole lot of listeners, and those listeners can basically talk to the other packages and get stuff done. That's when you have complicated requirements, and that's not, you know, it's not like everything has to be built through this, but if you have some things that do need a few packages to be orchestrated, you might use that. In other simple cases where one package just needs one other, you just leave it in there. All right. So that was exploring the package structure that we used. Um, I think the thing that was different with us, actually, I didn't mention, was that we actually just folded the API into the core, um, but it would be pretty easy to separate those things later. Um, that was just to reduce the number of repositories. We, we had about 60 going because they were all holding all these different packages. Um, now, any other ingredients that are important? Well, um, styling tests and unit tests, your packages, you might as well because you've got the stuff all nicely and neatly packaged away. Have that stuff tested, just going to bring up the quality and the, um, uh, your, your confidence in being able to deploy to production is just lifted so much with that. Um, that also, having unit tests on your packages will clear up any dependency issues because if there's a package that's using something from another one and it's not declared in the dependencies, it'll break and fail and you want to know about that because you've done something wrong. Um, and then grab the whole monolith and pull it all together and unit test and integration test the whole thing. And again, you're going to get a whole lot of confidence. You can go to production, no worries, whatever you've done. Um, other ingredients. Uh, we, so we had heaps and heaps of repositories. We're just doing composer update to bring them in. Slows things down a bit. Uh, the development experience isn't great. So we started doing the mono repo to mini repo and that obviously um, turned us back to going pretty quickly. There's things like split SH and git split, and um, there's a lot of things that are getting a bit better out there for being able to send commits from one repository to the other ones, and then continuous integration kicks off on those. Um, that's something that meant that you know you didn't have PRs across all these repositories. Um, learning to repeat yourself, I've mentioned that. That's something that's important as well, because uh, you know you spend so long in programming just learning to be dry, and all of a sudden you've got to go actually. Being dry can sometimes mean that you're doing the wrong thing uh, in terms of modelling a package because you're trying to lump things together that shouldn't be together. Um, let's jump into what you get with this. Why would we do it? Now, I think the benefits are, can I delete this? 
That's a good question. I think Greg Young's got a good talk about deletability. Um, I think it's a really good sort of indicator about uh, you know, whether you've got a big ball of mud or whether, you've, whether you're doing something the right way. Um, obviously with listeners, and you'll be probably familiar with this um, in Laravel and other frameworks, listeners are always pretty easy to remove because they just stop listening. Uh, it's also the case with this architecture. Um, removing packages is, is fast because you know exactly what they depend on. You know because you know what they're pulling in. Um, there's a very clear, definite interface between the packages. Um, so removing a package becomes quite quick. Now, I really want to has a microservice. I really want to do it. Well, uh, you are 90% of the way there by basically having this architecture. Um, uh, you have a message-oriented architecture, verifiably independent units. Now it's just about sticking that code in a new monolith, basically just <laughs> composer install just that one package, stick it on another server, and then tie it up with a real bus. So that might be uh, you know, SQS or Rabbit or whatever it is you want to use. Um, I did a test with this with ours and used something called NATS, N-A-T-S, um, and watched like all the events just fire off from uh, one of the systems going over to one of the others. Um, and it was really cool because all the events would be fired outside of the request response cycle of the user. Um, so the, the response was really quick because all of a sudden all these listeners that were doing work uh, on that one request uh, are no longer doing that work because basically the event just gets put on the bus, the response is straight back to the user, um, and uh, you're on your merry way. Oh, will I break anything if I make a change? That's always a big question. Well, you've got clear isolation, and I think it gives you more confidence and more flexibility to move. Um, uh, another good thing, I think, is like, you know, if you ask somebody new onto the team and you say, you've got this monolith, you've got this code, and you say, you know what, our code coverage is about, ooh, it's about 60%, we want to make it 80. Go. You know, they'll be like looking at you going, hmm, are you serious? Like, this is a big job. Um, but if you've got smaller packages, if you've got a smaller mental model, it's quicker to get into it. So you might have the user package. We need to bring that up to 80%. Yeah, cool, it's all there. I can see it. I know exactly what it's doing. It's really clear about what it's talking to. Um, cool, let's do it. Uh, we had database for each package. <coughs> so actually, when you open it up, whatever it is you want to look at that database, you might see, um, I think, Sometimes you see one table or one collection. We were using MongoDB. Sometimes you might see three. I think the most we had in any was probably about, I don't know, 10. Um, you compare that with some other systems. You open up and go, you know, ooh, what is all this stuff doing? And it becomes, it's much easier to get your head around exactly what a package is doing. Um, you know, when I say multiple database, obviously it's just one database instance, but um, you can, uh, they're all got their own schema. Marketing calls them a customer. Operations calls them a trader. I mentioned this already. Pa packages can mimic the language of the business. You're not, uh, you're not tempted to use the same user class in two parts because you know they're both different things. That means that conversations are no longer confusing with the business. Um, that means you move quicker uh, and there are less bugs. Uh, I want to be a reporting domain specialist. Well, you can apply a developer or a team specialisation. You can marry them to a package later as you get bigger. You might go, these guys are really good at doing accounting. You chuck them at that stuff. They just, they just, they're really good at that and become experienced in that. I'm not sure I would actually advocate that. I think teams should move around. But that's something that you can do and you have the flexibility to do. Um, all right, I'm going to jump into, I've already started. I've already got my project. Is there an incremental plan? And uh, there is. Uh, one of the things we did really early on is we hired in help, actually, because um, the PHP community is awesome. And um, some of these guys that have written these uh, CQRS domain-driven design libraries, uh, they're really happy to help, especially because you're interested in what they're doing. Um, and uh, the return on investment, I think, is definitely worth it, because you have conversations, trying to work it out, having a journey yourself, like, <laughs> why did you do it that way? And what is this? What's that called? And, They'll tell you and they'll happily tell you and uh, get them to cut some code. And that code that they cut and getting you started 
uh, is the kind of code that you go back to and go, ah, oh, yeah, okay, that's how we did it, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think that was something that really helped us out earlier. We had the guy that's the framework we actually ended up using. He helped us at the start. Um, you need to obviously assess domain-driven design CQRS bus frameworks. You might be able to use the stuff that's just out in Laravel, but I, I can't, you know, I haven't tried that. Um, introduce the messaging bus framework. So this is the CQRS domain-driven design. It can sit alongside whatever you've got now because you just, in, you know, it's just another service basically. It's not going to cause any problems. You can just introduce it. It's there. Um, select the next new significant feature or identify a candidate component to move it out. Build your independently testable package, which is just that bit. Um, create the CI pipeline needed to test that package. Update Composer in your monolith. Include the new package. Update the monolith kernel and DI contained to include this new package. And boom, you're done. So uh, that's how you can get started. Um, oh, yeah, there's a few steps there, I guess. Ten? Yeah. I, I was breaking it down pretty small, so. Um, all roses, okay, yeah, no, it's not all roses, you know, there's, there's tough parts, but um, uh, so you're going to have more um, source control repositories, Whew, lots more, uh, you're going to have more code. But basically, this is getting into a structure that means rather than just updating the model directly in the controller, you have to create a command class and a handler, you've got more code, it's just going to be the way it is because you've got a structure that you want everything to follow, flow through, uh, which provides, obviously, consistency. Um, PRs, uh, you might have a lot more PRs because you might be touching different repositories unless you master the monorepo, which I think originally, um, you know, when we got started, the monorepo was a bit of a hard one, but I think it's easier these days. And definitely, I would uh, advocate looking into it. Um, there's a lot more choices in terms of CKRS and domain-driven design libraries. Uh, that just makes it a bit tougher. I think there wasn't very much when we started. And so I was just like, well, that one. Uh, but now you might go, ooh, well, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, which one should I choose? Uh, it's a steeper learning curve for sure for a developer getting started. Uh, I won't shy away from that. Um, obviously, like anything, it's familiar familiarity, so you've got to get used to it. Um, Code reviews can take more effort, but that's also part of the reason. So code reviews need to look at things like dependencies, have you, how are the things talking to each other. But the idea is that you're having those conversations, so that's actually intentional, that that can be a little bit more effort. Um, making packages can be a bit of a chore, um, but you can scripting those things can help. Um, or maybe something like Symphony Flex, or maybe just some scripts that you run with Composer means that you don't have to actually do anything in the monolith when you require it. It just gets all shoved into your monolith. So there are things that you can help that uh, make it a bit less of a chore, but it is a chore that you're basically creating all these packages. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much. I've got um, a couple of links to on the next slide because I'll be sharing these slides and you can go and have a look at those. Thanks very much.